Welcome to episode 84 of Sport SA Daily Diary. Today we're chatting to two times Australian Open champion, Johan Crick. Johan, good afternoon. How are you? I suppose good morning for you. Good morning, Adam. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, you're all the way in Florida. Yeah, we have. Uh, I've been a Floridian since 1978, and uh, I lived in Naples, Florida, on the west coast of Florida. So we had beautiful sunsets. Uh, I lived there for nearly 40 years, and uh, post uh, post something in uh, 2008, the crash of uh, the world economy. I ended up taking a bit of a, a walkabout, so to speak, in Australia. <laughs> And uh, I ended up going to Virginia for three years. I went to Charlotte, North Carolina for five years. And uh, so I was, in, I was in a different part of the world for a little bit, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But I always knew I wanted to come back to Florida. I love the ocean. I love the weather. It's pretty nasty when it gets hurricane season. But, uh, you know, I, fl- I was a Florida guy. And uh, so I ended up uh, I'm back in Palm Beach Gardens area, which is just 20 minutes north of Palm Beach. So have my academy here so yeah we live uh, i'm back in florida now the last four years i mean i traveled there a good number of years ago and florida is i mean it's it's everything that everybody says is absolutely beautiful yeah it's a very different state from anything like maine or vermont or new england you know i mean uh, it's flat as a it's flat as a carpet um i think the highest point is about 27 feet above sea level (laughs) it's near orlando (laughs) So the highest point you're off the ground is if you climb on your roof, yeah. but uh, but it's uh, it's a great state. It's uh, it's it's unbelievably fast growing right now, as you can imagine, in the world of craziness. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think Florida is now the number one destination in the United States for for people to move to. Yeah, I sure. mean, New York New Yorkers are pouring in here like you cannot believe. I see more and more New York license plates everywhere driving and stuff so i think uh yeah it's uh it's a great state it's a it's great for business we don't have a state income tax so mm-hmm. that's one of the three states that don't have it in the united states uh as far as i know there's only three of them but uh, sure. uh anyway so yeah florida is uh, is going to be us for is going to be home i'm working on some tennis projects so we are uh, we are we are keen to uh, to stay on yeah yeah i'm sure and uh johan do you consider yourself south african or american uh, I uh, pledge my allegiance to America on, uh, on on the fact that I'm an American citizen, but I am. I've never forgotten my roots. I've never forgotten where I'm from. I never lost my Afrikaans. I speak Afrikaans every day with people. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of lot of South Africans live around me. Uh, Ernie Els lives here. Charles Swatzel, uh, Louis Westhuizen. I got uh, many other business guys that live in this area. From you know, I'm only about 45 minutes away from Boca Raton, which is. You know, there's a lot of South Africans in Boca Raton as well. Yeah, uh, yeah South, you know, South Florida has a lot of South Africans here. So, you know, I mean, uh, like any expat, you know, I'm very proud of uh, my heritage and I'm very proud of my country where I came from. I couldn't say I could be very proud of them both right now, no. uh, considering all the political craziness that's going on. I just don't, I just hope that the earth doesn't spin off its axis and disappears into some sort of a black hole in space, you know, because really what I see and going on around us uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a political animal. I love to read. I read a lot. Uh, I also have people in parliament in South Africa that tell me stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very scary at the moment. Um, you are obviously aren't always American or have lived in America. You were born in Pongola. Now, before we started the interview, you mentioned that in, in Natal. I'd never even heard of that before I did a bit of research on you. Where is Pongola? Pongola was, uh, is now part of KwaZulu-Natal. But back in the day when I was born, it was Eastern Transvaal. Okay. And our farm <clears throat> was located in such a way that I could walk to school from our farmhouse. It was about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile. And the town was about two miles away. Okay. Our farm, one of the borders was the Pongola River. And on the other side of the Pongola River was Natal back in the day. Yeah. So that whole area now is KwaZulu-Natal. So okay. sugar, sugar, farm, sugar farms, um, you know, when uh, the sugar price was down back in the day in the 70s and so forth, uh, 60s, my, my, my dad would uh, take 50 or 100 acres and plant cotton or plant vegetables or tomatoes and stuff. So yeah, we were farm people. 
we found people. And uh, you know, when did you find a love for tennis? Because you would imagine coming from that part of the world that you would be more sort of uh, geared towards rugby. Well, that's why you see why I'm a rebel and why I always buck the system and I'm always swimming upstream. And that grinds the hell out of people and I love it. Oh, now, geez. the fact of the matter is, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> in the sugar industry there, I mean, there was a sugar mill five, six miles away from our farm. Now, you can imagine all the, all the farms are connected by a little railroad track. Yeah. And so that's how I used to go with my bike. You know, I wouldn't go on the road. My dad didn't want me to drive on the road with my bike. So we would take the railroad tracks and go visit our friends. And so, you know, I didn't know at the time, but I was literally cross-training, going to visit buddies every day. I was driving, you know, five, 10 miles a day on a bike. So, um, so my love of tennis really stems to the fact that, you know, my parents were just average people, club players, you know, not super good. My dad was a phenomenal athlete. My mom was a good athlete. But my dad, my dad actually was in the Air Force in Pretoria as a young man, long before he married my mom, and actually played rugby with the Frick de Paris and those guys. Okay. And so my dad was a very, very good athlete. He was in the Air Force, and then he inherited the sugar farm, and he ha he gave up that sort of army career, or Air Force career, yeah. and moved to the farm in Pongola, which back you can imagine in the late fifties mid fifties was a very small town. Oh, sure. And so, um, uh, I was the eldest of four. I have a sister in Cape town. She lives in George and I have two brothers that live in the United States. So, uh, we were four of us all two years of space apart and uh, I'm the eldest of four and my parents just played tennis, uh, twice a week on a Wednesday and a Saturday or Sunday. And, you know, I remember we would, we would listen uh, next to the court on a VW bug. That was our car. And we would listen to the uh, radio and listen to Davis Cup. Yeah. And uh, so my parents, you know, I was just a really good little athlete kid. I was always active. And uh, I was always pestering them for them to play tennis with me. And I was like four or five years old when I started to play tennis with my parents. And they introduced me. And we only had two cement courts at the sugar mill because there was like the Afrikaans town. And then there was the sugar mill that was run by the British South Africans. And Hewlett Sugar was the big company. And uh, so this old Ralph Petty, I remember he was the head of HR and he always would take me and I didn't speak a word of English. And uh, he would take me by the hand and, you know, hit a few balls. He was a lefty, but he was a scholar of the sport. And he used to watch Laver and Rosewall and Durban and Johannesburg. And, you know, back in the day, South Africa, but most people don't realize that the South African Open was the fifth oldest tournament in the world. Doesn't exist anymore, but it was the okay. fifth oldest tournament in the world. So he would like go there and watch the Laver and Roseville and Newcomb, all these guys. And he would say, you know, Roseville slices like this and, you know, labor volleys like this. And, you know, so I had this, 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 this guy that I didn't understand very well, but he just, by virtue of showing me and holding my hand, he, you know, so I had sort of a really good start. <laughs> and I mean, when did you kind of realize that this actually might be a career for you? Um, obviously you went to Afiz, I presume you played, you played tennis there. Did you excel at, at tennis there? And were you playing any other sports at the same time? I, I, I played rugby all through my career as a youngster. I mean, I played in Pongola. I mean, you know, when you, when you walk barefoot to a school and you can run, they put you in everything. Okay, oh. so I swam like a brick. So that was out. Uh, but uh, I, was, uh, I was very, very fast. I was a good athlete. And uh, so I played, uh, I played rugby. I played cricket. I played tennis. Um, you know, I swam a little bit. I was very good at sprints, uh, you know, hundred yard dash, 200 yard dash, <clears throat> long distance, not so much the legs are too short, but, uh, and so rugby was sort of my first love because I mean, that's what most kids in those days did. All the boys played rugby. I mean, I have pictures where I played for my province where I, you know, the school, we, we were this tiny school from Pongola and we killed people that were 10 times bigger than us. And there's this group of guys at that age, and, and, and I'm actually going, and funny enough, you mentioned this, and I, uh, next year, June, I'm going back to Pongola for my 50th anniversary for our little school's final year, Standard 5. Oh, fantastic. So uh, my first, you know, my first inclination that I was really good at tennis was when I, I was discovered at age 10. This guy came from Pretoria. I remember his name was Gerald Stoffberg. Maybe he's passed on already a long time ago. But Gerald sort of was my was a guy that sort of said to my parents, "Oh my God, this kid needs to get out of here. 
And uh, I was just crushing the ball. And he said to my parents, and I remember this like yesterday, he just said, if he figures out why the lines are there, he's going to be a good tennis player. <laughs> so I was just wailing on the ball. And so my first tennis tournament I entered, I was 10 years old. I went with my grandparents to Nelspruit and lived in a caravan park for the full five days. And yes. grandma knit me a sweater and made me some porridge on a little primer stove. And I won the tournament, drove through the Kruger Park, looked at animals, went back to Pongola. And then uh, at age 12, I got a scholarship to go to office. And when I was 14, I was invited to go to Johannesburg to watch the South African Open. And I knew immediately at age 14 that that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. My professional tennis, yeah. So that's when sort of the, the tennis and the rugby switched, uh, switched parts or, or switched yeah. sides. I'm, I'm starting to write a book. And the stories and the stuff that happened to me as a youngster when I, you know, left or a right could have completely changed everything and how it all ended out mm. and how it all played out was just uh, it's pretty fascinating. Um, I used to play against Kepler Vessels. I don't know if you remember who he was. Yes. I mean, he was, yeah. he was a cricket captain for, for Australia, right? Yeah. Well, Kepler and I Africa. about, yeah. Well, this is an amazing story. He went to great college. I was in office. And uh, so one time, this club doesn't even exist anymore in, in, in Pretoria. It was called Union Tennis Club, and it was uh, somewhere in Sunnyside, Pretoria. And uh, I played him, and he was killing me. And it starts to rain. It was in the summer, and it started to rain, so we had to come off. Match wasn't finished. And you know the story. You go back out, the whole momentum changed. I ended up beating him. And he was a hell of a player. I mean, he was a very good tennis player. He was, he was just a super smart guy. Very good cricketer, multi, multiple talented guy, much more so than I was. So we're sitting in a locker room, dripping sweat, and we just, I just beat him. I was like 13 or 14. And he just says, you know, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop playing tennis. I'm just going to play cricket. And I, at the moment, I felt like he was just kind of mad that he lost. And, you know, he was serious. So that match, he quit and really? focused on cricket. Yeah. And that was his last ever match. That's what I remember, yeah. Sure, that's uh, that's quite a a story for for you. I mean, yeah, certainly something. You will not happen. believe you will not believe the intersections and the V's that come out of stories from my side. Borg, Mac Mac I, I was the victim of McEnroe's first tournament win on the ATP tour. I mean, he won he won his first tournament, beating me in the finals. Michael Chang beat me for the first time in the finals, first tournament. Boris Becker won against me, first tournament. Stefan Edberg won against me first tournament. I mean, everybody seems to have beaten me. I've given everybody a free ride. But you certainly beat them back, and we're going to get into that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, do you feel that playing multiple sports helped you with your tennis? A bit like, I suppose, Kepler playing tennis, helping him with his, with his cricket? No question. 100%. I, I, um, look, I... Uh, I I understand that the early specialization is important. Uh, that's fine. You can, you know, I mean, I, I specialized in tennis at a very young age and I kept playing other sports. Um, I think not only is it a great physical thing, but I also think mostly it's a very good balancing mental aspect. If you are in something else in a different scoring system, even if it's a team sport, I was very good at team sports, but what I really shined in was, was the um, the single sport minded type of thing so you know when i was in athletics you run against other guys but it's just you but tennis in my in my opinion is an extremely unique sport because you have you know you you have to rely on everything you do whether you think differently or you get mad on the court or you're happy or whatever it's it's just you i mean you yeah. you're out there on center court at wimbledon and there's you know 15,000 screaming fans against you or you play the us open now it's 21,000 people yeah, you know, it's a it's a it's a daunting task to be able to, but but I seem to thrive on that. You know, I love that uh, challenging uh, environment. I've always been like that. I mean, I've I've chatted to quite a few uh, sports stars over the lockdown period, and it is, is sort of a common story that everyone has played multiple sports in their youth, um, and then kind of found their sports. It's been very few that have found their sports at an early age and done really well. Um, so it's quite an interesting fact that, you know, these other help, uh, sports help, help you along the way. Um, in your late teens, you moved to Austria. Yeah. Why? 
Very interesting story. When I first came to Pretoria, a huge, huge change in my life. I mean, I used to go to Pongola Little School barefoot. I mean, we would play rugby at recess and the buttons are ripped and all that stuff. You know, little kids had a blast, come home. My mom would just like be pulling her hair out. All the shirts are ripped from rugby <laughs> uh, and bruises and scrapes and all that. Um, and uh, when I went to Pretoria, I mean, it's coat and tie, polish your shoes, make your bed, get up at 6.30. I used to get up at 7.45, school starts at 8, run like hell. <laughs> Completely different life. Very necessary, looking back, that that happened to me because it structured me much better. Um, and so, yeah, that was, uh, you know, my brothers and sisters, my, bro my two brothers and my sister all went to Freyheit for high school because we didn't have a high school in Pongola. Now they may have, I don't even know, but yeah. so uh, now I digress. What was your question? <laughs> uh, your move to Austria. So when I went to high school, a very short period of time, uh, I met this guy, Ian Cunningham, who was uh, kind of like the guru tennis coach in, that, in, in, in Northern Transvaal back then. It was the uh, Pretoria area. Very well-known guy, even in Johannesburg. He was like one of the top coaches in the country. And <clears throat> so he was living in Pretoria. So he was sort of the guy there for the, our school. He, he coached the school team. He saw me there and immediately, immediately just sort of took me under his wing. Now, there's a bit of history. You know, I was eight years old. My dad had a terrible farm accident and uh, he, he became a paraplegic and I was involved with help save him. And I was eight years old. So a major impact on my life, mm -hmm. on the family and everything. And uh, so my dad was in a wheelchair since I was eight years old and he farmed out of that wheelchair for 27 years. So when I went to high school, uh, little did I, you know, my, my dad's accident had a massive impact on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became sort of the man in the house from a very young age. And that tragedy is what made me so good and what made me so tough, looking back on it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, dissected it and been through it and understood it. and. You know, it was, a, it, it, it was a blessing for me, a terrible accident, but it made me totally different from what I thought I was ever going to be. So I met this guy, Ian Cunningham. He took me under his wing. He became sort of the guru coach for me. He would give me tennis balls to pray, play with. I mean, I was besotted about tennis. I was absolutely driven. I would hit against the wall in the morning at my high school in the wintertime in my pajamas with a tracksuit over it. And people would walk to school by seven o'clock and they were just like, what the hell, this idiot, you know, he's in the cold, he's hitting balls. He's not even playing tennis, he's hitting against the wall. And I would do this forever. I mean, I was always, you know, very dedicated to my tennis. Uh, even though I loved the school and, you know, I, I had to go through all of that. It was a big school. It was a very tough school, as you can imagine, the history of it. And, um, so Ian Cunningham uh, emigrated at age 15. When I was three years into working with him, he emigrated to get a better job. And he just went to Austria overnight with his whole family. And he had a good player. He had a good daughter as well, a bit younger than me. He was a good, also a good tennis player. So we ended up uh, apart. And, uh, you know, when I, when I remember what I felt like when I saw the South African Open, I saw... I saw Ash, I saw Connors, I saw a couple of guys and the hair on my neck was standing up at age 14. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, that never left me. I mean, I was now 15 years old. My coach emigrated. I was kind of a bit lost, you know, because we didn't have professional coaching in the school. So I kind of flip flop. And at age 17, I was extremely sick from the flu. I didn't finish my last year of exams and I really was afraid they're going to hold me back because I didn't I didn't write the last three weeks of, 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 of my school uh, exams mm -hmm. and so I went home when I went home for the for the holidays <clears throat> recovering at home from the flu with my parents in Pongola I decided without anyone's help that um, I, I want to play tennis and so they talked to Ian Cunningham in Austria he said, bring him over. I have an extra bedroom in my apartment. And that's how I ended up in Austria. I left in January of 1976. I flew on Swiss Air and I flew to Zurich and he picked me up in a dead of, dead of winter in February. And, uh, or January it was. And uh, I had a short sleeve shirt on because it's summer in South Africa. And 
That was a quick uh, realization to, to go get a parka or something warm, but uh, I've never felt cold like that in my life. But uh, that's how I started, and that's why I ended up in Austria and uh, stayed with Ian Cunningham and his family for on and off for three years. I was in Austria, but obviously a lot happened in that time. I mean, I, I ended up coaching, making money to support myself. At age 17, 18, I was working with Ian and coaching a few kids. He threw my way, and, and I paid him my, my, my room and board. And I would take the train everywhere in Europe. I mean, I could take a train to, to France, to England. I mean, uh, yeah, I, 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 I lived in Europe for three years. And then in 1978, I came to the U.S. to play a satellite tour. And my whole life changed because I, I did so well. In nine months, I went from completely obscure in tennis, 800 in the world, to top 20 in the world in yeah. nine months. And, uh, Johan, do you remember your first professional game? Hmm, first professional game. Um, you know... Back in the day, there was a lot of satellite tours uh, or satellite tournaments, like uh, the absolute lowest rung of the professional tour was like uh, you go and play three or four weeks of tournaments mm. to get one ATP point at the end of the day. So it was like really, really apprentices. I mean, that was a super apprenticeship. So I would say, you know, it must have happened in Austria somewhere. Um, I must have played a satellite tour, I think, in Austria so long ago. Um, because I didn't, uh, I was already, when I came to the States in 1978 in February, I was uh, 837th in the world, yeah. which means nothing. Um, but, uh, so I was already gotten some ATP points. So it must have been in Germany or Austria where I went to, to play in a, with a train or something. Uh, and that's uh, how I sort of got my first points. And uh, you mentioned a little earlier that all of these players had their, their first win against you. You've still beaten some massive names. I mean, you beat Agassi, Connors, McEnroe, Edberg, Chang, Borg, uh, just to name a few. I mean, that, that was the, the creme de la creme of tennis, and you've beat them. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly, uh, looking back, it's like, I can't believe I, I've beaten so many t top players. But, you know, there's a couple of guys that got away. But, you know, I never beaten Becker, but I only played him twice. Mm -hmm. I've uh, lost to Lendl, and I only played him twice, two or three times. Uh, so, you know, some people like a McEnroe, I played him 22 times, I have nine wins against him. So, you know, those kind of things... Uh, uh, are, are sort of out there. But yeah, I mean, I had a, an amazing career. I'm very fortunate um, to have stayed healthy for a very, very long time on a pro tour. I got injured at the end of my career because of, uh, uh, because of my elbow. I had severe tennis elbow because we were trying new equipment and we were basically test pilots for these companies. You know, nobody knew that if you go stringing your racket 10 pounds higher, that your arm's going to fall off nine months later. It felt great to serve. It felt great to, to, to play with it. <laughs> Suddenly, I could uh, hit the ball harder. I was, you know, I was sort of languishing. And then this new technology of graphite comes along, and you change it, and you try it. And suddenly, I beat Agassi Chang back to back in one tournament. And I'm like, yeah, I'm back, you know. And then your arm falls off nine months later. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I was very, very fortunate to have played for you know, I played 16 years on a pro tour. I mean, that back then, that was unheard of. Mm. That was unheard of. And then uh, I took a three-year hiatus from my elbow surgeries. I had three of them. Two reattachments, one cleanup. And uh, Connors called me in 1993. And it was four years after I basically slid off the tour. I didn't retire. I just sort of slid off because of injury and never said goodbye. And so I always had this mindset, I was going to come back. And I did. You know, I qualified for Wimbledon 16 years apart. Really? Yeah. I qualified for Wimbledon in 1977, and I qualified for Wimbledon in 1993. And I, uh, I, I remember my last Wimbledon. I, um, I qualified at Roehampton. I beat some really good juniors and good players in that qualies. And then um, I had to play Javier Sanchez, who is the brother of Emilio Sanchez. He's a good player. I mean, basically a dirt bowler. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to play this guy on grass. You know, I've won Australian Open and on grass. And I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to whack this guy. Well, it happened to be the wettest first week in Wimbledon's history. is 1993. We played literally a set on Monday. And I didn't finish the match till Friday. And, you know, and I ended up losing to the guy in five sets. It was just ridiculous. The balls were the size of soccer balls. And 
was wet and slippery. It was a survival and he survived. <laughs> so that was my last Wimbledon. So that was it. Well, I mean, yeah, you've had a, a good run at Wimbledon and we'll get into the seniors uh, uh, Wimbledon uh, story a bit later. Um, but quarterfinals at Wimbledon, semifinals at the US Open and the French. Um, and yes, you lived in um, America pretty much all your life, but Australia must have a very special place in your heart. I love Australia. I mean, I could live there tomorrow. Um, I have a lot of friends there. And I was very fortunate the first two times I went to Australia, I won the tournament. I thought, you know, it's, it's going to continue like that. But yeah. uh, those are very hard to do. Very, very hard to win those things. And uh, I, got, I got to the semis again one time. Uh, a couple of years after that, and uh, and then the Edbergs and the Villanders popped up, and they started winning those things. So, uh, you know, Australia is uh, it's a very special place. I, um, you know, it's kind of like uh, I almost felt super home there because you know Australia is the same weather as South Africa. It's got a lot of the same mannerisms. The countries are very closely related, even though we fight like crazy and all other sports, but. Uh, I love Australia. It's a great, great place. And uh, yeah, if I didn't live in the States, in fact, I actually contemplated moving to Australia at one point. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot of South Africans do. Um, but you don't, I think you downplayed it a little bit. You won back-to-back -back Australian Open titles. Back-to-back uh, -back is a pretty difficult thing to do. But funnily enough, you played the same opponent in both matches. Yeah, can you believe it? Um, that is probably one of the most amazing trivia, but people don't I, I saw this trivia on the front page of the USA Today newspaper many years after I won. Yeah. And it was a, it, the CEO of Northwest Airlines, which doesn't exist anymore, was a big tennis guy. And I got to know him. I flew on Northwest all the time to Asia. It was a big airline from the West Coast of America to Asia. So I used to fly Northwest to Japan and all over the place. But uh, his name is Chris Clauser, and Chris was the CEO of Northwest Airlines and, uh, and loved tennis. And so they had this like promotional thing on USA Today, which is a huge newspaper. And they had like this front page thing in the corner and the top. It was like a little trivia. Name the player who won uh, the Australian Open 1981 and 82 against the same opponent, but in the same calendar year, which is even more ridiculous. So think about that. I won the Australian Open in the same year, twice. <laughs> because they changed the dates. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so that was kind of like, wow, I didn't, I forgot about that. You know, <laughs> I, was, uh, I think I have it somewhere in my office here, but it's uh, Northwest Airlines. Yeah. And a so, so, yeah, Steve Denton to this day is a good friend of mine. He's a, uh, he's a Texas A&M uh, coach for a men's team in college now. Uh, Steve and I have, have, have had, we've had a good life. We had a great run. Uh, I think we both eat, we both love barbecue, so it looks that way now. What's but, a barbecue, uh, Johan? <laughs> it's a braai, man. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we've we've overeaten. Let's put it that way, the two of us. <laughs> oh, you, you're fully <laughs> deserved. Uh, over your career, you won 14 singles titles, eight doubles, um, and you reached a career, a career high of of seven. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable career. Um, and without doubt, you're the only South African to win a Grand Slam. So it could quite easily be said that you are South Africa's flag bearer for tennis. Well, that's a heavy load. Um, I can only say I'm very fortunate, very blessed that I, you know, I work really hard. I mean, um, you know, there's many, many ways to the top of the mountain. Mm. But uh, I could only say that. Um, you know, I, I was very blessed. I was very fortunate. I got the opportunity to do what I wanted to do. Uh, I think when I told my parents I wanted to play professional tennis at age 17 and want to leave school, they were probably scratching their head that night, didn't sleep much. And I remember walking into the principal's office, Manir Rush, back in the day. He's probably still alive. And I had to walk into Manir Rush's uh, office and tell him that uh, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be the school prefect. I'm not going to be the head, head of the class because I was a class clown, but I was also kind of a leadership kind of guy. And, uh, and I tell him I'm leaving the school. Who the hell does that from office? It doesn't happen. Yeah. And um, 
So I broke the mold a bit and it was very scary. I mean, I, I, I was shaking. I mean, I was like, this guy's going to kill me. And he just said, you can make money off this. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it turned out all right. I'm, cert I'm sure they're certainly proud to have you. Um, we chatted about Wimbledon earlier. You've won the Wimbledon doubles over 45 title four years in a row, uh, playing with Kevin Curran. That must have been a, an awesome uh, experience for you two South African boys cleaning up at Wimbledon. You know, <clears throat> I got to be super. I mean, Kevin Curran is one of my very, very best friends. We come from completely different backgrounds in a sense, yeah. you know, but uh, I got to know Kevin uh, much more so after the pro tour was over. And I regret not playing with Kevin when I was in my prime. I really do. I think Kevin and I. We played you know, against each other a few times. Yeah, actually, I beat Kevin the year after he got to the finals of Wimbledon. I played one of the unbelievable matches in my career. I played against him. But it wasn't because I wanted to get to him. It was just that day. I was so good. I mean, it was like, you know, I was a good grass court, very good fast player. But that day, I picked his serve. Everything was gold. And I beat Kevin in straight sets the year after he got to the final. So, you know, that was a big win for me because, I mean, I knew Kevin could take anyone out. I mean, he beat Connors and McEnroe two years in a row at Wimbledon. So, uh, you know, anyway, so to come back to Kevin, I, I really feel, uh, you know, it's really, really a shame that we were never able to play Davis Cup for South Africa. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to do that. Um, Kevin and I were both top tenors. We both really good serving volleyers. We could have played singles. We could have played doubles. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we would have had a very good shot at winning Davis Cup outright against anyone. Yeah. Because we've taken out the big guys before. So it wasn't like it was, you know, uh, an alien th situation for us to play the big guys. And uh, so, uh, yeah, um, Kevin and I, over the, over the last number of years, have become super, super good friends uh, to this day. Uh, our wives are about the same age. And um, he has two kids. I got two kids. And, you know, Kevin and I played Wimbledon. We get together and it was like, you know, Hand in glove, you know, we just go to Wimbledon, go to, go to have dinner and then come back and play the next day. But, and we won it four years in a row. And we are like, shall we, change, shall, we, shall we chase Roger Federer and see how many we can win? <laughs> Why not? We lost. We lost. We only won four. We had no other equipment to come to six or seven. So yeah, Roger won away with that one. But the funny thing was, I got to tell you this, the first year Kevin and I won the doubles at Wimbledon, we beat... Um, we beat Heinz Guntar and Baraj Tarochi from Hungary on uh, court one in the finals. And we clocked them, straight sets. No chance. And the next three years, we played the Maccas. We played Peter McNamara and Paul McNamee, world-famous doubles guys from Australia, also great singles players in their own right. Probably Peter McNamara, bless his heart, he passed away last year. Um, you know, Peter McNamara was probably a better singles player, but he was, you know, they were, the, they were the Aussies that were unbelievable doubles players. And Kevin and I beat them three times in a row in the finals. And all three times they had match points on us. They needed therapy after the third year. I think they just decided, you know, if they see us in a draw, they're not going to enter anymore. <laughs> Between them and Steve Denton, I'm sure that they'd love to see the back of you. Um, well, the chances of winning something three times in a row at Wimbledon when you have match points against you and the same oh, opponents is, is unheard of. <laughs> no, completely. Um, Jan, as mentioned earlier, you, you've played and beaten a lot of players. Um, a twofold question. What was it like playing McEnroe? Um, I'm sure you played him when he, he threw his uh, toys out the cot once or twice. And who is the toughest player you played against? Jeez, that's two questions that are loaded. Um, you know, the first tournament McEnroe ever won, he beat me in the finals of, in a tournament in Hartford, Connecticut. I remember this, the United Technologies Open, and he beat me in straight sets, like 7 5 six, four or something. And uh, I was like, man, this guy is such a jerk, but he's so good. And, uh, you know, I was like not fond of him at first. But, you know, that's the, that's the side of sport, that you have respect for people, but when you're sometimes in the heat of battle, you know, things can get out of hand. So you say we both chucked our toys out of the pram sometimes, <laughs> which made for very entertaining tennis. 
So because it's emotion, it's like it, there's an element of, you know, uh, there's an element of respect that, that, that is easy to see with, this, with the spectators. And then there's, then there's times where there's no respect and there's just like this, you know, growling and just the fangs are coming out. And it's like, yeah, it, it made for some interesting tennis. But uh, McEnroe was a unique talent. Um, you know, he's the uh, same age as I was. He was on a tour maybe a year before I actually made it on a tour. And, uh, and we played each other quite a few times and, you know, uh, he became number one in the world. I, I got him a few times in tournaments and, uh, one of my most, probably one of my most memorable matches was, uh, my second win in the Australian Open happened in December of 82 and the newspapers were talking, oh, well, you know, the Australian Open isn't that quality of a grand slam that it is with the others which to a certain degree was kind of true, but hey, you know what? If you don't play, you can't win. Okay, so I won it twice and I got to the semifinals another time and I've beaten these guys before. So, hey, you know, if you don't play, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So uh, to make an interesting story. So four months after my win in Australian Open the second time, there was a newspaper article written by a very famous tennis writer that to this day is writing for ESPN and some others. And he said, that, uh, you know, in a very negative sort of backhanded way, oh, you know, Creek assistant also ran. He's not good enough for the top guys. He can't stay with them. And so I ended up playing in the Memphis, which is that time it was played at the Memphis Racquet Club indoors. It was a U.S. National Indoor Championships. It was an early indoor tournament during the winter time. And I got to the finals against John Macaron. Mm -hmm. And I beat him 6-4 in the third. I shut that guy up. Yeah, you know? yeah, Creek's not good enough to play these top guys. You know, I love it when these and, things happen. But that's the press, you know. That's just exactly how they are, you know. And uh, that was one of the most satisfying things is to see this guy sitting in the, in the, in the press conference. Just didn't say a word. Didn't ask me one question. Oh, good on you. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. Yeah. And the toughest, the toughest opponent? Well, you know, that's a very loaded question. I think you're going to have to categorize it in some formula. Let me explain. I don't think I've ever played anybody with a tougher mindset than Bjorn Borg. Mm. Okay. What I felt against him when I played him in the semifinals of the U.S. Open was unlike anything I've ever felt. Because you can kind of, what comes out of a racket is what is in the head. Mm. And I've played them all. I mean, I've lost to Lendl. I mean, Lendl was just... He was a terminator. I mean, he was just a bludgeoning you. He was the fittest guy. He was the first professional athlete to peel the skin off a chicken drumstick to cook it with no sauce, no nothing, so that he doesn't have fat in his body. I mean, Unbelievable. I was perfectly happy with KFC. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, I think in pure genius, I don't think Macaro could be beat at the time when you play him on a fast court at Wimbledon on grass next to impossible to beat him on talent, nobody better, uh, on brain power stress that the guy can exert on you. I don't think Connors was close. Mac uh, Lendl was close, but there was just nothing like a board, mm -hmm. you know, the Iceman thing. It was like, he, he just, when he beat me in five sets, I, well, first of all, I was always a bit tired. I mean, I had won five set matches before that. So, you know, you go out there, you are like patched up. It's like sending out a fighter jet has been shot down and shot up by the German Luftwaffe. You know, I mean, you, yeah. you, you, you act like you, you, you're fine, but you're not really fine. And so you go out there and you try your best. Jesus, I said, unbelievable the first two sets against Borg. I just, I was good enough for a best of three set match. Let's put it that way. And then, uh, and then he woke up. But honestly, I don't think, uh, the most stress I've ever felt on a tennis court was Bjorn Borg. Okay. And I mean, he, I think he ended his career too early. Um, yeah, and just, no, in yeah. just in closing, you're obviously still involved in tennis now. Um, do you have any talents that are coming through your academy that uh, we should be looking out for in, in the, the years to come? You know, I... Um, I had my academy in different parts of the world over the last 12, 13 years. I'm back here in Palm Beach Gardens and uh, we have a small academy. I just run a really good business. Most of my business is from the local market. You know, um, I've had really, really good juniors in the past and uh, I have good kids that can go to college. 
when I say, uh, do you have any world beater kids? People would always assume just because I was a top tennis player that people will seek me out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been seeked out by some of the biggest names in tennis to coach them. And either the timing was off and, you know, um, I have a wife and young kids. I just don't want to travel that much anymore. I want to be home. So I just run a strict business. You know, I don't force people to be in my academy. I don't, uh, I don't give scholarships. Um, I just straight up business. You know, you, you value my time on the court with your kid or with your top player. Uh, and that's how I roll. So uh, we, have, uh, we have some plans for the future, which we are working on. So um, very excited about that. Uh, it'll be it'll be big news once we pull this together. But um, I have some incredible partners that some of the best in the world in terms of what they do in their business. So we're very keen to see where this is going to go. I've always been an outside of the box thinker, which is extremely dangerous. It's very stressful <laughs> because you take enormous risks, enormous risks, and you fail most of the time. And so you know, people always ask me, they go. You know, Johan, before we go, uh, can you impart some, some knowledge on my child? Thinking that I'm going to say, oh, you know what? Blow out your candle. You're going to have your cake and you're going to have a happy life. Mm-hmm. You know, I wish it was like that. But uh, what I can say to people is that if you don't cry, if you don't bleed, if you don't feel like you want to quit, if you don't go through all of those horrendous, heart-wrenching um, uh, uh, changes in your life where you feel like nothing, that you feel totally lost. Those are the best moments to learn from because anybody can be happy just on a superficial level and just say, Oh, you know, life's hunky dory, you know, and this is unfortunately where we are in this world, you know, with these smartphones and the way our lives have been. And now suddenly here's a virus. And the next thing there's a co- complete collapse of society. There's a collapse in your businesses and stuff. And then I said, and, and I said one day, pretty dejected because we're all in the same boat. Mm-hmm. I'm in the same boat as, 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 as Richard Branson. Yeah. He's, he, my business is failing. People are dropping like flies. I have no income for three months. This guy has to run around trying to find billions of dollars to save his business. It's the same stress. Mm-hmm. We're all in the same boat. So mm-hmm. I was saying, you know what, Johan, this is where you look back. You sit back and you say, I've been here before. How did it feel? What did you do? Did you plan? Did you just lie in a heap and cry and just give up? Mm-hmm. This is the time to plan. This is the what this is the time for renewal. This is a time where you're going to make changes in a world that is going to be lasting for another generation or two or three or maybe for more. Yeah. So I'm looking at it as an opportunity. It is incredibly hard to accept where we are. Look at South Africa, what is going on. Look what's happening in America. People are burning down our cities. You know, yeah. that'll pass too. We will learn from that. It's a hard lesson. But, uh, you know, yeah. I look at it as an opportunity. It's hard. It's extremely painful. But you have to learn from it and you have to plan for the future because we cannot sit and cry in a heap and just give up. I, I've never been a quitter. At times I felt like it. But... Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm in a tennis business in a completely different environment than when I used to as a professional. And honestly, it was easier to be a professional than it is to be now. Yeah, no, much sure. easier, sure. much easier, much easier. No, no, it's been brilliant chatting to you today on Sports SA Daily Diary. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, even though you are so far away, we're still incredibly proud to have you as a South African uh, and a Grand Slam winner. So thank you. It's been an absolute joy to chat to you. Hey, Adam, thanks for inviting me. And it's a pleasure talking to you guys. I miss South Africa. I'm going to come back uh, maybe in November for some golf with some friends. And I'm going to come back next year in June, hopefully to Pongola. And uh, I'm always open for any of these things. So feel free. I love to tell stories. Awesome. Typical thanks South African. We love our stories, right? Exactly. <laughs> our stories and our prize. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Look out for tomorrow's episode of Sport SA Daily Diary, where we chat to the voice that's been bringing South Africa sporting results for generations.